Well, good morning and a very, very warm welcome to you all. And a special welcome if you're joining us online. I hope that uh, today is going to be a real celebration of the great things that God has done. I was just thinking, I was, I was driving into Malvern this morning quite early, and it was full of mist, and it was absolutely really difficult to see, and then the sun started to come through and breaking through it all, and just like, wow. And the whole Malvern Hills opened up, and I'm thinking all the people at the festival today, thinking how beautiful an area we live in, and what a joy it is for then the sun breaks through, the mist is scattered, and we can live in the warmth of the sunshine. End of sermon. If you're here for the first time, very special welcome to you. And if you're a visitor, a special welcome to you as well. We're going to begin our worship by recognizing God's presence with us. We're going to be led by worship in worship uh, in a moment as we gather together in the presence of God. So let's stand together. We meet in the presence of God, who knows our needs, hears our cries, feels our pain, and heals our wounds. Let us worship the Lord, all praise to his holy name. Let's worship the Lord. And if you'd like to use some instruments, or if you'd like to get a flag, we're going to have one song where we recognize what Jesus has done in being born, living, dying, rising again, and then ascending to heaven so that he might be with us by his spirit now. Let's worship God together. Father God, who is worthy of all our praise, all that you've done for us in Jesus, and all that you continue to do through your spirit now, we pray that your love may motivate us in everything that we're about. We might celebrate what you're doing in amazing ways. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Please do be seated. Now today we want to give thanks really and to pray for a family who have been with us for about a year now and who are going back to Kiev in Ukraine tomorrow. So I wonder if, uh, if Christina and uh, Anastasia and Miron and Mark would like to come
forward to and Ada as well, the grandmother. It's a, it's a real privilege to have had you with us during this time. And uh, we're going to, it's, it must be a strange feeling to be going back home to d tomorrow, isn't it? Yeah. You're quite close tomorrow. So I wondered if uh, I could ask, first of all, Christina, if you could just tell us a little bit about what led to you hosting this wonderful family and help us to understand the process that went on there. Just for a minute, do you want to use that microphone a minute? Like so many of us who watched, <sighs> knew this would happen, <laughs> <laughs> who watched the news last year, the beginning, you know, March, the beginning of the war, um, it was a kind of daily weeping, um, either internally or externally. And um, sometimes I sit still long enough to hear God. <laughs> and, and it was quite clear. I thought, oh, we, could, we could have some refugees we, from Ukraine. We've got a big enough property. My mum's house is large. Um, so I thought, mum will never agree to this. <laughs> so <laughs> the next time we were sitting at the table watching the news, I looked at her and I said, perhaps we should have some people from Ukraine. And she said, I was thinking the same thing. <laughs> so that was easy. Um, and when people say, oh, that's so good of you, um, it's God's idea and it worked. And um, it was easy. It was easy. And what's interesting to me is that um, this is where something as big and ugly as the war in Ukraine becomes personal. And I didn't realize how much it would change us by hosting. And they've been wonderful, <laughs> really wonderful. But so have you, and lots of you have been really supportive. And I want to thank you for that, because Barry and Debbie, to start with, who are gathering names and getting support of all kinds, providing car seats. Mary Flynn came around with toys and car seat and all sorts of things. Um, Stephen and Georgina Belden came and painted and hung radiators back on the wall. <laughs> really useful things like that. Um, so lots of practical support, and that's been amazing. Um, yeah, and Sveta, I don't know. Is Sveta here? No, she is a Russian lady who has been here, sometimes at St. Andrews, and uh, she is married to a British man, and um, given her situation as a Russian, it's been really difficult um, for her, but she's been really supportive and taken them out often and, and been friends with. I just want to say that Anastasia, um, Miron and Mark are leaving, but Arda we are keeping for the time being. <laughs> so I know some of you recognize some other uh, Ukrainians in the congregation, so do keep up those conversations. You know, it's easy for them to be a little group together, but it's important that we are uh, welcoming as a church family. Thank you so much. I wonder if I could ask uh, Anastasia if uh, you'd like to say anything at all about how, it, how it's been for you as a family, staying with Christina and their folk. <laughs> can, you, can you say something? To, Not too much. Not too much? <laughs> oh, I, want, I would like to thank you for everyone in this church, in this town. I want to say thank you for Christina. <laughs> this was uh, very difficult for me, but this was a very nice time with you and this amazing town, amazing people in this country. Thank you so much. And uh, when the war um, over, I meet everyone in Ukraine. Yes, <laughs> wonderful. Thank you very, very much. <laughs> yes, it, now, I know, I know that uh, you boys have had a good time as well. It yes. must be feeling a bit, ooh, what's it like going back? And, uh, but we wanted to give you something to remember us by. And Helen, who's been uh, part of your team in this church, she, is she here? Where is Helen? Oh, can you get her, please? <laughs> and uh, we also wanted to be able to 
to say thank you for all that you've brought to our church as well and all that you've done to help us feel connected to incredibly difficult things in Ukraine and yet the resilience that your people are showing in the most amazing ways and we are praying personally that you will find that peace and the, the strength to continue going back to Kiev now you in, in, the, in the future going forward. Can I just put out a little I can, yes, <laughs> can I just put out a little advert as well? We have a, a Ukrainian friend, single mum with a six-year-old boy, who needs to move closer into Malvern. She has been um, out at Cradley for the last year. A beautiful position, but out in the sticks, and it's really hard. And she would love, from the summer holidays, to be able to live more uh, centrally. So if anyone feels the nudge, do come and have a word. Um, They'd be very grateful. Okay. Well, we'll. I think that uh, when you go to your groups this morning, children, you'll be able to receive a gift from the church. In the meantime, I've got a card for you from us as well. And we pray for God's blessing. That's for you all you as so a family. Much. Let me pray for you all. Lord Jesus, we thank you so much. For Anastasia, for Miron, for Mark, and for Adam, we thank you, Lord, for the way in which you have uh, helped us to get to know them, for the relationships we feel because we're united in your love, for Christina and her mum, and the hospitality they've been able to show, and for the obvious love and bond between them. Thank you, Father that you have your hand on them now and always will have your hand on them as they go tomorrow back into the unknown. We pray as they go back into that situation that they may know your guidance, your protection and your power. In Jesus' name, amen. 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 Thank you so much. Thank you, Thank you for coming. Oh. Ah, oh, right. <laughs> Thank you very much. Uh, here we are. Here we are. I've got it here. Look, it suddenly appeared, as if by, by Helen's magic. The stories that Jesus told. There's a book for you. And here is The Friend Who Forgives. Now, that's a wonderful storybook about the ways in which God works through friendship and love in the Bible. Thank you so much. Okay. Oh, let me say, Lisa. Thank you so much. That's okay. Great. I think you should share them. Okay. <laughs> Lovely. So I think the children now are going to go to their groups and uh, experience some more teaching and fellowship together. So if you'd like to go and uh, move to your groups now. As we come before God now, we thank him that he's present with us and that he comes. you remember we heard at the end of the uh, teaching on the resurrection how Jesus came and breathes on them? The card that I gave to Anastasia and her family was all about the breath of God it's breathing on them and filling them with life in its fullness. So we pray in these simple words that will appear on the screen now, that God might be with us and we might feel that sense of him breathing his life upon us. Let's be open to God. Maybe you just want to stand with your hands open to receive from him. Maybe just slow your breathing down a little bit and sense the presence of God among us. (laughs) 
Be with us, Spirit of God. Nothing can separate us from your love. Breathe on us, breath of God. Fill us with your saving power. Speak in us, wisdom of God. Bring strength, healing and peace. And since we are surrounded by so great a cloud of witnesses, let us lay aside every weight and the sin that clings so closely. Looking to Jesus in penitence and faith as we pray together, Loving God, we have sinned against you. We have done evil in your sight. We are sorry and repent. Have mercy on us according to your love. Wash away our wrongdoing and cleanse us from our sin. Amen. Amen. Right spirit within us and restore to us the joy of your salvation. Through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. And may God in his mercy forgive us, draw close to us, embrace us once again in his loving arms and enable us to follow him in worship and grateful service each day of our lives. Amen. Let's sing together the wonders that God has done in Jesus.
Sing together what gift of grace. What gift of grace is Jesus my Redeemer? There is no more for heaven now to give. He is my joy, my righteousness and freedom. My steadfast love, my deep and boundless peace. To this I hold, my hope is only Jesus. For my life is holy bound to His. Oh, how strange and divine I can sing. All is mine, yet not I, but through Christ in me. The night is dark.
Lord, we praise you that not only now, but in eternity, we can continue to glorify you, to express what is deep within our hearts, our worship of you, our adoration to you. Lord, give us that perspective, we pray. That because of what you've done in Jesus, his dying and rising again, we might spend eternity with you. And you have reconciled us through the cross and brought us into that relationship of love and trust whereby we can call you Abba, Father, and know the embrace of your love forever. Lord, we pray that you would fill us with such a, a sense of wonder and joy and hope for what you have done, that we might continue to share that with others so that the world might believe that you are God. And we pray that as we listen and hear and respond to your word, we might be encouraged, we might be inspired, and we might be equipped to be your people in this world. In Jesus' name, amen. Please do be seated, and uh, we're going to hear the holy word of God. So then comes to read from the scriptures. Okay, it's there as well if you want. Today's reading comes from Colossians chapter 1, verse 24. You can find that on the Bibles um, on page 1182. Paul's labor for the church. Now I rejoice in what I am suffering for you, and I fill up in my flesh what is still lacking in regard to Christ's afflictions for the sake of his body, which is the church. I have become its servant by the commission God gave me to present to you the word of God in all its fullness, the mystery that has been kept hidden for ages and generations, but is now disclosed to the Lord's people. To them, God has chosen to make known among the Gentiles the glorious riches of this mystery which is Christ in you, the hope of glory. He is the one we proclaim, admonishing and teaching everyone with all wisdom, so that we may present everyone fully mature in Christ. To this end, I strenuously contend with all the energy Christ so powerfully works in me. I want you to know how hard I am contending for you and for those at Laodicea and for all who have not met me personally. My goal is that they may be encouraged in heart and united in love, so that they may have the full riches of complete understanding, in order that they may know the mystery of God, namely Christ, in whom are hidden all the treasures of wisdom and knowledge. I tell you this so that no one may deceive you by fine-sounding arguments, for though I am absent from you in body, I am present with you in spirit, and delight to see how disciplined you are and how firm your faith in Christ is. This is the word of the Lord. Good morning. Just pray, Lord Jesus, I pray that these words that I speak this morning would be acceptable to you. Amen. All right, where's my flicker? Let me I wonder if anyone knows who these two good-looking chaps are. Hey, yes, excellent, good. It didn't fall flat right at the start. So, yeah, they are Lance and Andy. Uh, they're the two main characters from the BBC comedy, The Detectorists. Uh, and the show follows this pair as well as uh, fellow members of the, the DMDC, the Danebury Metal Detecting Club, as they're searching the fields of Essex for anything that they could be described as treasure, which, judging from their finds table, uh, mostly consists of buttons, ancient drinks, cans, pulls, and old coins. So one of the things that the show captures really well, I think, is this sense that whatever you might find, whatever you discover buried in a field, there's almost this compulsion 
So to keep searching, because you never know what else you might dig up. You never know when you're going to need to break out your gold dance, which I'm told all detectorists have, just in case they find gold. If you've never seen the detectorists, there may be some of you here, uh, you're in for a treat, really, because you've got three series and two specials to catch up on on iPlayer. I recommend it. So this week we're on the, the third instalment of our series looking through the book of Colossians, Living the Christ-Centred Life. So we're going to have a bit of a quick recap and uh, set a bit of the context of where we are. Paul is writing, along with Timothy as well, mentioned in the first chapter, to the Colossians uh, from prison, which is quite relevant in this morning's passage, talking about suffering. Paul's never been to Colossae, uh, but he heard about the church there from Epaphras. Uh, his account of the church and the teaching they're receiving seems to be the reason that Paul wrote to them in the first place. You see, he's concerned that they're in danger of being deceived by fine-sounding arguments, as he puts it. So Paul's putting them straight on who Christ is, what he did, and what that means for them. So two weeks ago, we had Helen telling us about Christ's invitation to us to join him on this journey towards glory. And if you're here, you might remember that fantastic picture of uh, Carpool Karaoke. Uh, I've, I've just since imagined my life as singing with Jesus in a car with James Gordon in the back. But... Uh, uh, last week, Joe spoke about uh, the fact that the gospel is the good news that all things are reconciled to God through Jesus' resurrection. And this week, our title is Labouring for the Gospel. So let's jump into that and see where we end up. Now, I have to confess, when I got the, uh, the schedule for the preaching and I saw this passage and I read it, my first reaction was, Huh? It's, it's very typical Paul. He writes in these kind of long, convoluted sentences. Um, they're, they're reasonably short in this passage, but some of his sentences are very long, and you need to read them multiple times to really get what he's saying. Here he's kind of describing his mission, or as he puts it, the commission God gave me to present to you the work of God in its fullness. As we know, it's this mission that, that Paul has dedicated his life to, ever since his dramatic conversion on the road to Damascus. So this morning, I want to take a look at Paul's mission from sort of three different angles that, that this passage presents. The first thing to notice is that Paul continues his mission despite difficulties. This is a man who is single-minded in fulfilling what God has called him to. He knows what his mission is, which is to share the good news of the gospel with everyone. And he's not going to let anything stop him. Look at the phrases he uses just in this passage. He says, I rejoice in what I am suffering for you. To this end, I strenuously contend. I want you to know how hard I am contending for you. The ESV puts it, for I want you to know how great a struggle I have for you. This is a man who was imprisoned, beaten, and shipwrecked multiple times. In Acts 14, we, we hear the story of how he was stoned in Lystra for speaking about Jesus. And they only stopped throwing rocks when they thought he was dead. Despite that, he gets up, goes back into the city, and the very next day, he was preaching elsewhere. I don't know about you, but I would have thought that having rocks thrown at you until you appeared to be dead would warrant at least one day off, if not a few weeks. But, but Paul isn't deterred. In Romans 5, he, re he writes, we rejoice in our sufferings, knowing that suffering produces perseverance. Perseverance produces character, and character produces hope. At the start of this passage, Paul picks up on this, this theme of rejoicing with suffering. And here he makes it clear that it's, this suffering he's, he's going through is on behalf of Christ's body, on behalf of the church which is the second angle that we can look at, at Paul's mission from. Paul's mission is a mission to the church. Part of what Paul is commissioned by God for is to build up the church, hence writing this letter to them. Although Paul wasn't involved in founding the church at Colossae, he sees it as part of his mission to help them grow in their faith, 
to reach full maturity, as he puts it. Look at the start of chapter 2. My goal is that they may be encouraged in heart and united in love, so that they may have the full riches of complete understanding in order that they may know the mystery of God, namely Christ, in whom are hidden all the treasures of wisdom and knowledge. All one sentence, of course. Thanks, Paul. Paul isn't content with mere converts. He wants the church to have a complete understanding of Christ. I was reading um, Philippians earlier this week. Uh, In Philippians 3, Paul says, I want to know Christ. And it just jumped out at me. It amazes me that Paul writes that, I want to know Christ. If anyone knows Christ, then surely it's Paul, the man who spent so much of his time writing to churches and explaining who Christ is to them. But, But Paul acknowledges that there's still so much more to know. There's a deeper treasure to find. In Philippians, again, he says, not that I have already obtained all this or have already arrived at my goal, but I press on to take hold of that for which Christ Jesus took hold of me. In Christ are hidden all the treasures of wisdom and understanding. Just like the detectorists sweeping the fields day after day looking for treasure, Paul is encouraging the church to seek after the treasures of wisdom hidden in Jesus. Today you might have found a gold coin, but keep looking. Tomorrow it might be a hoard. And that brings us to the third point about Paul's mission, is that the treasure isn't just treasure for the church to discover and hold on to for themselves. It's a treasure to be shared with everybody. It's a treasure to place on the finds table, where everyone can look at it and wonder. Paul's mission is to proclaim these things far and wide so that we may present everyone fully mature in Christ. God has chosen to make known among the Gentiles, even the Gentiles, the glorious riches of this mystery, which is Christ in you, the hope of glory. You can't keep this to yourself, says Paul, because Christ in you is the hope of glory for your future, but is also the hope of glory for those living around you, for those in the next town, the next province, the next country. Christ in you is the hope of glory for the whole world. So let's just recap on those points just before we look at what they might mean for us. Paul's mission is twofold. Firstly, it's to proclaim Christ to everyone and to give them the chance to become part of this growing church. Secondly, it's to build up the church so that they become fully mature and have a complete understanding of the wisdom and knowledge of Christ. And the third point is that Paul doesn't let anything stop him in his mission. Whether it's difficult circumstances or personal suffering, Paul gets on with the job single-mindedly. What about us? What can we learn from what Paul wrote here to the Colossians? Well, the first question, I guess, is have you put down your metal detector Or are you out there in the fields every day searching for the next piece of treasure? If Paul can still say, I want to know Christ, then surely the same is true for us. However long you've been a Christian, there are always new depths to plumb in Christ. I love that in this this letter there's a sense that this isn't something we have to do alone. Yes, our faith is personal to each one of us, but it doesn't mean it has to be a private thing. We're not sitting here as a a bunch of isolated individuals, uh, but we're all part of the same body. We're all a family. I want you to know how much I'm struggling for you, writes Paul. Are we struggling, contending, labouring on behalf of the people sitting around us this morning? If you find treasure, put it on the finds table so that we can all see it. Bring it to your life group. Tell someone over coffee after the service. Do whatever you need to do to share that nugget of wisdom with somebody else so that we can all be built up and encouraged and united in love by what you've discovered. We need to help each other to focus on Christ in us, the hope of glory. Why is it that Paul says we need to seek to continually become mature? If you look in chapter 2, verse 4, it says... 
I tell you this so that no one may deceive you by fine-sounding arguments. This is such an important sentence. I tell you this so that no one may deceive you by fine-sounding arguments. Which means that we need to be aware that it can happen. Without going into the specifics, I think we're at a point where there's so many questions about what the church is, what we stand for, what our place is in the world. And the debate around that can often be full of fine-sounding arguments on all sides. But fine-sounding arguments aren't the same as truth. Jesus is the truth. Christ in us is the hope of glory. Not fine-sounding arguments are the hope of glory. Paul is highlighting the importance of focusing on Christ, in whom are hidden all the treasures of wisdom and knowledge. I don't think Paul's saying don't listen to the opinion of others. God doesn't expect us to switch off our brains and, and kind of completely ignore all rational thoughts, but our primary source of truth is Christ. And when fine-sounding arguments don't seem to match up with what he says, Paul's quite clear about which one to follow. Which brings us to the other part of Paul's mission where the church interacts with the rest of the world. And we do need to interact. Our culture is increasingly trying to tell us that our faith isn't relevant. Christians are tolerated as long as they don't expect others to take notice. Christianity should be kept out of the public arena. It isn't relevant in government or schools or businesses. You can have your faith, but keep it private, we're told. And we can't do that, and we shouldn't do that. Not only is Christ in us the hope of glory for our own lives, he's also the hope of glory for this town, our government, our country, the whole world. Our faith isn't private. It's the hope of God's glory for the world. And not only is our culture telling us that we're not relevant, but it's also becoming increasingly offendable. It's more and more difficult to say anything about anything without offending someone. Is Christianity offensive? Absolutely. People took offense at Jesus all the time. Why do you think Paul was stoned in Lystra? It wasn't because they liked what they were hearing. They were offended by him. Our culture tells us we're not allowed to offend people. If someone doesn't like what you've got to say, please keep it to yourself. Or perhaps tone it down a bit. Or take this little bit out and then it'll be fine. It's less likely to offend somebody. Is that what we should do? Should we make the message of the gospel a bit more relevant, a bit more palatable to our current culture? Absolutely not. It's the hope of God's glory in the world. And if that makes it harder to be a Christian in 2023, then perhaps we just need to rejoice in our suffering. I don't want this to sound like a rant, I'm getting a little bit ranty, but <laughs> quietly ranty. It's an Anglican rant. <laughs> I just want to encourage us all to hear what Paul is saying in this passage and put it into practice. To be people who unendingly seek out the treasure of Christ's wisdom and share it with those around us for his glory. Christ in us, Christ in you, the hope of glory. Now go find some treasure. Just take a moment to think about for a moment and allow that uh, word to go deep. Go find some treasure. And we find Jesus more fully. What could we do differently this week than we did last week? Where might we look for that treasure? Let's just be still for a moment and ask ourselves those questions and allow God's Spirit to maybe point us in the right direction. Give us one word that we might follow through. The implications of 
God's word to us this morning. As Mary said to the servants, whatever he tells you, do it. So Lord, would you send us out in the power of your spirit to live and work to your praise and glory. Amen. Now I want you to share with you, I thought it was a very appropriate time to share uh, something of one of our mission partners' work. Uh, Debbie, who is normally, who is the champion of this work, uh, isn't able to be here today, but she's uh, provided some resources and materials that we might enter into something of the, the struggles and the amazing way in which the Fletcher family are working in Bangkok, in, in Indonesia. It's incredible to just think about how they live in that situation. They uh, adopted a Thai girl uh, who was uh, into their family four years ago, and they work with the organization Urban Neighbors of Hope, and they're living in the slums of Bangkok. Um, they are ministering by being a presence of Jesus in those places. This might be called presence evangelism. And you can see there that they have a real sense of calling. We felt called to stand with the poor in the way we see modeled beautifully in Jesus. They're looking at the example of Jesus and just seeking to be Christ where they are. And we have followed the call to be present with our neighbors in solidarity and care. There's a very clear thing, link between the way in which St. Paul felt that calling, that commission of God to be there and to do things. But their mission is to re reveal something of the life of Christ where they are. They love to see God's kingdom taking root in dark places, they say. The Spirit of God goes as light in the darkness. And one of the great things they've done is to set up a fair trade, non-profit jewelry making business called Roy Rack, which has transformed the lives of women working there. So we're just going to hear a very brief um, sort of update from uh, the Fletcher family from John, who's going to speak to us through video, and uh, just to give us a glimpse of what's happening and the feel and a visual uh, sort of grasp of the area that he's living in. And we want, as we watch this, we can bear in mind the things that we're thinking about with St. Paul's labors all those 2,000 years ago and the way it's still going on today. Thanks, Derek. Hello everybody at St. Andrew's Church in Malvern. Thanks for the request to make this video. It's a joy to be with you on your Mission Sunday. Um, I'm John Fletcher, married to Elise, and we've been living and working in Thailand for the last nine years. We have three children, Elliot, Sam and Bo. Um, and many of you know right now, Elise is back in the UK with Elliot and Bo uh, because her mum is unwell uh, and I'm here in Thailand with Sam carrying on our work here and Elise is working remotely most of the time. Uh, I'm, I'm making this video from our house, this is our neighbourhood, Chumchon Rim Klong Wat Sapan and you can see the port there in the distance. Um, 
So as you know, we in Urban Neighbors Hope we move into neighborhoods facing urban poverty and really try to love God and love our neighbors from that context. Um, many of the expressions of what that looks like change over time. Uh, but um, the main things that we're engaged in at the moment are the Jewelry Project, which is Roy Rack. And Elise runs that, even from a distance. Um, and I've been working uh, closely with uh, a couple of other organisations to help the government to reform care for, for children who, who need to be looked after. Um, so uh, our update is that the work continues, whether we're in the UK or here. We're actually coming up to a year where we'll be in the UK for most of that year and we hope to be able to visit more um, and continue what we can from overseas as well as having a time of sabbatical during that year. Uh, so we value your prayers as we transition from country to country. Uh, it's always slightly complicated. Um, and I would also value your prayers for a situation that's uh, been happening today actually. Our good friend and next door neighbour um, had an arrest warrant issued for something he was involved in nine years ago uh, and there's something seems to be something very unjust about about what's going on um, and we just seek your wisdom and uh, to know how best to help in this situation uh, and his wife uh, is the manager of our Roy Rack jewelry project so uh, we're very involved in that family's life and um, trying to work out today exactly how what's going on and how best to help. So yeah, we'd be grateful for your prayers. Thank you for all your support. We couldn't do this without you. So let's pray for John and those situations. Father, we do thank you for the ways in which the Fletcher family are witnessing to you and the treasures and wisdom, the hope of glory that you bring. We pray for the things he's asked for, for that transition time, that it may be something that they feel your sense of peace and your wind in their sails. And that you would help them with your wisdom, Lord Jesus, over the issue of his friends, uh, arrest warrant and we just pray that that may be resolved in a way that will bring uh, glory to you in some mysterious way. We thank you for all our mission partners and for the way in which they are living out that life today and we praise you for the way in which you Christ are working through them and living your life in them. May we on our front lines be your people in this world. May we see Christ in others and be Christ to others as we seek to walk closely with you. In Jesus' name, amen. So we're going to pray more widely in a few moments, but I just wanted to draw your attention to a couple of things going on this week. Uh, and this week is a very special week because in the life of the church on Thursday, of course, uh, we celebrate the ascension of Jesus on the 18th, on Thursday the 18th. And the great uh, celebration of him rising to heaven so that he might send the Holy Spirit and fill his church and his people with his power. And so there are a lot of things going on, but one thing that I wanted to mention uh, was uh, happening on our, um, in our calendar. Firstly, there's a, a special day or special evening of prayer at the, in, the quiet, in the waiting room on Wednesday, this, uh, this Wednesday, it's, uh, starting at 7 o'clock. An opportunity just to wait upon God in quiet and to receive the life and spirit of God in a fresh way. That's at All Saints. Um, the day after that, on the 18th, uh, we're having a, a service here at 11 o'clock where I'll be celebrating Holy Communion on Ascension Day. And then in the afternoon, something quite different, Messy Church will be taking place uh, at, uh, in, in the afternoon at All Saints again. Following the initial launching of Thy Kingdom Come on Ascension Day, 
We have all sorts of resources to help us as a church to take part in that and to be part of that identification with the disciples who were waiting upon the Lord until, as Jesus said, to receive the Holy Spirit may come upon them. And Novena have produced some excellent resources to do that. Thy Kingdom Come Prayer Journal. Please do take some of these as you go out today if you haven't already got them and use them during this week. There's plenty of details about how we can participate in Thy Kingdom Come on the website and opportunities to sign up for some prayer during the time of quiet reflection uh, in the light towards the end of that time here in church. Ladies' breakfast is taking place on Saturday at nine o'clock in the uh, St. Andrew's Church Hall here. So it's an opportunity to come together and everybody's welcome to come to that as long as you're female. And then lastly, I just want to plug again the, uh, the opportunity to have a quiet day at the Wellspring. This is something which, um, if you're not used to just being quiet for a, a, a while, it is a marvelous opportunity to be still in some beautiful surroundings and to experience God's peace. I was there this last week, and uh, God's peace is there too. No question about it. So you can just come and sit and enjoy being part of a spiritual encounter with God on the 30th of May and then on June the 27th. But you do need to sign up for that to book a place. We've got a few places left on both of those days. So that's the news for this week. We want to move into prayer now and Nigel is going to lead us in a time of prayer that we can focus on uh, two or three different things and to opportunity to gather into small groups to do that uh, as Nigel will explain. Thank you. Thank you. Yes, we're going to pray for three special people who we know and love in this church. That will be our focus today. And so um, we'd like you to form small little groups where you're sitting to be able to pray through some um, pointers that we'll put up on the screen um, in a moment. Of course, we understand there'll be guests here and maybe some of you perhaps would quite like to pray silently yourselves in the group. That's fine. But if we could now just move and form those little groups and then I will go through the, some pointers to pray for our special three people uh, and then I'll be leaving you short periods of time to pray. So if you could move, please, that would be wonderful. Thank you very much. Do we want to to play? When he's got the room, come to the... Yeah, right, come to the... Yes. Oh, right, during the prayer session. Okay, yes. So if you could pray... We have to slot next slot. Okay, so um, our first special person, of course, is Dave and, of course, his family as well. I put up a few pointers here. Pray for rest during his sabbatical. Um, God would meet him as he moves up to the Hebrides. Uh, clarity for what God is calling us to be and do and of course for the family but of course you often will know far more about these things so pray through that or pray specifically for things that you know um, anyway let's just have a short burst of prayer for Dave and then we'll move on to the next special person thank you
Okay, if we could um, move on. So next I'd like us to pray for Liz and uh, Jan and Kirsty in, um, in the office. Um, inevitably with Dave being away, quite a lot more pressure and things uh, have fallen on them uh, in the last few weeks and I'm sure will continue to be that way. And so let's pray for, um, for them. Um, you can see there about using time wisely uh, and then once they're out of the office to be able to lay aside all of that, that would be a, an amazing thing. And then a couple of ministries that Liz heads up for Pathfinders and for Chaos, there are issues that would be well worth praying there. So again, if we could now focus on the office staff and Pathfinders and Chaos, that'd be great. Thank you. Okay, thank you. And um, can I I encourage you to, to, when you see them around the place, to thank them because they labor long hours uh, on our behalf. The third special person I want us to pray is uh, for Helen, who heads up our children's ministry at the church. Um, Joe last week uh, quoted something Helen said to him, and uh, I paraphrased it from memory from Uh, what he said, I want children to know that God loves them and that Jesus can be their friends, which I found absolutely profound when thinking about the children of the church. So there are plenty of things uh, about um, children's ministry and the work that she heads up and, of course, all the faithful people out there serving uh, with their whole hearts uh, this morning. So there's some pointers there. So let's pray God's blessing on Helen and then pray... God's blessing on the children uh, as they meet this morning. Okay, let's pray for them.
Finally, let's pray for anything that is on your heart at this moment, whether it's people in difficulty, illness, facing challenging situations. Pray for those that are on your heart. Thank you. Thank you very much for praying for these things. And can I encourage you to continue to lift these people up during the week? Thank you. As you put the church back together again, please do stand as we uh, just come to the conclusion of our worship. As Paul proclaimed the faith of Christ crucified, so we want to affirm that. And I'm just thinking, not only affirming it with each other, but to think of all the people around Malvern at this time, that we can affirm to them as well that uh, these things are true of God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. So let's pray for them as we declare our faith for one another and our world. So we say together, I believe and trust in God the Father who created all that is. I believe and trust in Jesus Christ who redeemed humankind. I believe and trust in the Holy Spirit who gives life to the people of God. I believe and trust in God, God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Amen. Let's worship the King of Kings.
its breath Till the snow was blue for good For the land we conquered death And the dead rose from their tombs And the angels stood in awe For the souls of all who come To the Father are restored And the church of Christ was born to him who by the power at work within us is able to do immeasurably more than anything we can ask or think or imagine. To him be glory in the church and in Christ Jesus for time and eternity. And the blessing of God Almighty, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit be upon you and remain with you now and always. Amen. Go in peace to love and to serve the Lord. In the name of Christ, amen. Please do take advantage of the opportunity to receive prayer. If you feel you'd like to have that, there'll be prayer offered at the front here. There's coffee in the hall, and I hope you have a wonderful week laboring and finding that treasure that God has for each of us. Amen. Thank you.